All right, folks, we're back with the uh, Molesburg panel, columnist and contributing editor of TheRoot.com, David Swerdlick, and acclaimed author, lecturer, and commentator on religion, society, and pop culture. Um, let's see, sports isn't in there. i got to ask Rabbi Brad Hirschfield why he doesn't include sports in that uh, repertoire. <laughs> uh, and uh, so let's continue, folks. And let's, uh, let me ask you, uh, David, uh, the, the governor, Governor Nixon, uh, I didn't hear everything he said, but I saw that he said the, um, the, the violent uh, protests uh, cannot be repeated after the grand jury either you know, indicts or fails to indict and the announcement is made. He also said that the National Guard will be on standby. Um, do you buy into this uh, rules of engagement uh, proposal that the protesters made where among those rules they were requesting that the police don't use any tear gas, don't dress in provocative gear, uh, allow water bottles to be thrown at police? Uh, you know, do you buy into that nonsense? I think there needs to be rules of engagement. I'm not saying, I'm not a law enforcement expert, so I don't know what exactly they should be but look what we saw back in august was a situation where yes there was some looting and some rioting but more so what we saw was uh police really kind of out of hand right using tear gas on people people peacefully demonstrating um arresting people with no charges etc so i do think there has to be uh it's incumbent upon protesters to be orderly and it's incumbent upon police not to uh, abuse people. They work for the people. It's not the other way around. They're civil servants. They're, it's not a police riot out there. So yes, there should be. Rules yeah, but 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 Brad, Brad, but Brad, uh, I would argue that uh, police have to view everybody in that crowd as a potential threat, uh, and uh, because of the experiences they've had, because of the criminality within the crowd in the past, the threats from the uh, the crowd, and uh, maybe you know, verbally, leaders are saying it's going to be help to pay. Uh, and uh, you don't know who's in the crowd, and you have to contain it as a police officer. You can't treat it as, as, as let's say, a thousand individuals. They're a group. No, you're right, Steve. Crowds have an interesting dynamic, and it's a real problem. You also can't bring with you past angers when you manage crowds, because that can create a problem. But here's the thing. Police are civil servants, but the way that works, David, is that that means the people who make up the community have to behave in a civilized way. So and, yes, and there are rules, rules of engagement, and in fact, there are rules of engagement in our culture. And what they demand is that you're right, police not purposely provoke out of their insecurity, but it also means that people, no matter how righteous their indignation may be, can't go out of their way to provoke a riot. And when you violate that, there is going to be a response. So this is about defending either side. It would be really interesting if the people asking for rules of engagement started with five or ten rules about how their conduct needed to be different than the last time before they told the police how theirs needed to be different. The, the overwhelming majority of people who have been protesting throughout this issue in Ferguson have been peaceful. No one, including me, condones rioting, looting, burning down a gas station. If those people are found, they should be prosecuted. Everybody else is exercising their First Amendment right to protest, speak, assemble, etc. The police work for the taxpayers, not the other way around. And so, but David, David, if David, if, David, if out of a crowd, David, if out of a, if out of a crowd of peaceful protesters comes seven bottles out of a thousand people, uh, or or, or a Molotov cocktail, one Molotov cocktail, what do you think the police are going to do? Walk through the crowd looking for the person who did it? No, clearly not. And again, I'm not an expert on police tactics, but what they shouldn't be doing is rounding people up without charges, telling people that they can't stand still on street corners, tear gassing uh, camera crews, uh, you know, d d pushing people off corners in their own neighborhood. I could keep going on and on with the list. Look, we would not have this discussion if we were not talking about uh, this community particularly. Look, look, I'm not saying the police are racist. I am saying, though, that this is part and parcel of ongoing tensions between law enforcement and African-American communities. And, and for a change, this stuff got out in national media, and people need to recognize that police have to uh, obey the rules just like protesters have to be, obey the rules. So I think it's good that Governor Rabbi, Nixon is preparing Rabbi, for this. Rabbi, what if, what if parents taught their kids black, white, Hispanic, yellow, green, always obey the cops? Uh, these kinds of instances would not arise. So look, there are times that you're going to dissent and there are going to be issues with police officers. But you're right, Steve. The, and the fact is, Dave, with all due respect, maybe you're right, I don't agree, you kind of did suggest that the cops are racist because you suggested this would have been handled differently in a different community. If that's what people believe, then let's say that. But I think right, you're ten, right. Ten Steve. seconds, David. Go ahead. With all due respect, Rabbi, I have been pulled over and charged with something that I didn't do. With all due respect, as a college student 
on my college campus. I was hit with a billy club in a peaceful protest. So I don't want to hear any talk about, oh, I'm just calling people racist out of thin All air. All right, David, just David Swerdlick and Rabbi Hirschfield, but we will continue. You got the last word, Dave. Thank you. Uh, folks, we'll be back. Uh, good discussion. We'll be back with the one and only Mark Stein after the break. But first, World War I ushered in a new modern era of warfare. Uh, let's take a look back uh, at that uh, now with Global War, This American Moment. It was called the war to end all wars, but instead it only served as a prelude of worse things to come. It was the world's first universal war with the nations of the United States, United Kingdom, France, Greece, Italy, Russia, and 19 other countries declaring war on Austria-Hungary, Bulgaria, Germany, the Ottoman Empire, and the other European-based nations. As the wars before it, and those after it, this war would prove to be a long, bloody, and costly conflict. For the first time, chemical weapons were used in organized warfare. In 1950, the Germans unleashed 150 tons of chlorine gas at Ypres, Belgium. Then two years later, used mustard gas against the Russians at Riga. World War I also gave birth to a new form of battle called trench warfare. Opposing armies would build elaborate trenches opposite one another, protected by barbed wire. The trenches themselves became havens for disease and life-threatening infections due to poor drainage and sanitation. The area between the opposing armies became known as no man's land because it was fully exposed to artillery and small arms fire from both armies. Attacks, even if successful, often sustained severe casualties for both sides. So when it finally came to an end, on the 11th hour of the 11th day of the 11th month in 1918. Soldiers from both sides greeted the news with great skepticism. Neither side dared to let themselves believe their long nightmare had finally come to an end, leaving an estimated eight and a half million people dead and some 21 million wounded. The actual peace document known as the Treaty of Versailles was not signed until six months later on the 28th of June, 1919. Although the face of the civilized world had forever changed, 21 short years later, history would again repeat itself. For Newsmax TV, I'm Bill Curtis, and this is an American Moment.